good evening. Uh, this is uh, 5 p.m. on a Saturday. Uh, my name is Ashok Kamath. I am the secretary of the IIT Alumni Center, Bengaluru. Uh, for those of you who have seen our physical meetings, uh, third Saturdays is when we would have a meeting either at the Koromangla Club or at the Bangalore International Center uh, uh, with talks like this. Uh, with the current situation, we are trying to make the best of what there is. And we've now come up with a series that we call a dash of knowledge. And it will begin today uh, and every Saturday from now on, uh, we have lined up speakers till the end of May. Uh, for every Saturday we have speakers. Uh, this is the first time we are trying Zoom, so uh, do bear in mind if there are some glitches here. Uh, Hopefully there aren't any, but uh, you know, do, do forgive us if we make a few mistakes here. Uh, today's speaker uh, is uh, Professor Rajesh Gopakumar, uh, who is the director for the International Center of Theoretical Sciences, uh, which is a part of TIFR uh, out in Hesargatta. And uh, you know, I discovered one interesting fact about him yesterday that he was all india rank one in the je the year he appeared uh, and uh, joined iit kanpur to do his five year degree in uh, physics and then went on to princeton uh, to finish his uh, you know phd uh, he's done many other uh, been to many other places harvard uh, the harish chandra uh, research institute in allahabad and uh, uh, was a visiting professor at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton. Uh, needless to say, very, very well awarded uh, with uh, you know, all that you can think of that's prestigious. Uh, and uh, so uh, he's going to speak on uh, Stephen Hawking's legacy in fundamental physics. Uh, you know, I think those of us in sciences and engineering uh, do love to hear stories about Stephen Hawking, a frail body in uh, a brilliant mind in a frail body uh, is something that uh, we've always seen. Uh, on the panel today, again, we have uh, Professor Anindra Sinha, uh, who is at the Indian Institute of Science uh, at the uh, Center for High Energy Physics. Again, a Bhatnagar awardee, and uh, interestingly, uh, again, factoid did his, uh, his PhD supervisor was Sir Michael Green, who was the location chair of mathematics at Cambridge. So, uh, you know, another uh, uh, proud event there. And we have our own Sushila Venkatraman, uh, part of our uh, ACB, IIT ACB governing council there. The protocol we'll use today is that if you have questions, there's a button on the Zoom screen at the bottom called Q&A, so you could type your questions in. Uh, somewhere in about 20 minutes from the start of Professor Gopakumar's talk, we will take a pause to answer some of those questions and then continue for another 20 minutes and again take questions. And at the end of the 60 minutes, uh, we will uh, have a brief discussion uh, with the Professor Ananda Sinha and uh, uh, Professor Gop Kumar and Sushila, and then uh, uh, take more questions and end up uh, hopefully within the 7 p.m. window. Uh, so uh, I will just conclude here by saying uh, watch out for more talks. Uh, the next week's talks uh, will be announced uh, uh, the same way that we announced this one uh, on Monday or Tuesday. And every week after that will be the same thing. So we're looking forward to having an exciting uh, series here uh, that all of us will benefit from. So with that, uh, Professor Gop Kumar, over to you. Uh, <coughs> thank you, uh, Ashok. Uh, it's a pleasure to do this, uh, have this new experience of uh, uh, doing this webinar. Uh, I, I would like to uh, thank all of you who joined in. Uh, at least you didn't have to uh, overcome the traffic and so on. Uh, so uh, I hope this will be uh, this will be 
uh, something you'll enjoy. Um, and uh, I think the, uh, the series that the IIT Alumni Center is, uh, has launched uh, is a great one, especially in these times. Uh, uh, and uh, it, uh, it's, uh, it's very, it's wonderful that there's a whole uh, set of uh, talks uh, lined up. So um, uh, I, uh, I, I, uh, I will um, say a little bit about um, actually in the context put Stephen Hawking's work uh, for which he is so renowned uh, in the context in a slightly broader context and bring out its significance. Uh, I'll try to be uh, non-technical, uh, but um, uh, but many of you are uh, from um, uh, from an engineering or sciences background, uh, so hopefully at least the broad picture will uh, will come out. I think I'll have only two equations uh, probably in the talk, uh, and they will be reasonably simple equations. Uh, so. Uh, and as Ashok said, we'll uh, stop for questions in the middle uh, in case uh, you want to clarify something that I said, which was not particularly clear. Uh, longer questions we can probably have at the end. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, so Stephen Hawking, of course, uh, as uh, uh, all of you have heard of, uh, he was probably uh, one of the most uh, famous uh, scientists alive of the last uh, few decades, um, and uh, oops, uh, his his story, his life story, is uh, was particularly inspiring uh, uh, to people. Uh, and actually, while uh, making this uh, uh, webinar, uh, I was um, uh, uh, it. Uh, it uh, I mean, I was thinking that his story of uh, brilliant mind inside a failing body uh, uh, and yet overcoming it is in some ways uh, uh, something uh, we, we reson can particularly resonate with in our immediate circumstances right now. In a sense, it's sort of the ultimate lockdown a person can uh, face uh, when uh, you, you can, your brain is active and very creative, but uh, yet you are forced by circumstances uh, to be sort of uh, uh, self-isolated, so to say. Uh, so, uh, so in some sense, that's a kind of, uh, uh, um, uh, it's a particularly resonating uh, theme. These are pictures of Hawking at various stages of his life. Probably you might, some of you might have seen the movie Theory of Everything. Uh, uh, and uh, you know that till his mid twenties and so on, uh, there was no indication of any uh, illness, but then he was afflicted with this degenerative uh, neuro, uh, neu neural degenerative disease and uh, got progressively more confined. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, as time went on, uh, he lost more and more of his uh, facilities uh, uh, and uh, uh, functioned entirely through a computer interface. Uh, so I won't spend much of, uh, so I won't really talk about his life story uh, as such, as I said, I will talk more about his work and place it in the broader context of uh, modern physics. Uh, and uh, uh, Hawking is justly famous uh, in the world of physics, not only for uh, being, uh, for having done important work, uh, but it, for addressing some of the most profound questions uh, of physics. And, um, uh, and, and his most important contributions, which I will talk of, happened in the mid 70s, uh, in the mid 1970s, uh, and uh, was about the properties of black holes and the Big Bang. Uh, and uh, so these are uh, things that I will talk uh, more about, um, particularly black holes. But uh, again, here I can't resist saying that in some sense, uh, 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 these cosmic questions that Hawking spent uh, most of his life wrestling with are, uh, are once again a kind of uh, metaphor for humankind in general, uh, while we are quarantined on this little planet, which is uh, a very nondescript little planet in a solar system on the outskirts of uh, a Milky Way galaxy, which is in itself a sort of a very uh, run of the mill uh, galaxy in, in a very vast universe, but yet, uh, uh, all of us humans who 
uh, who've been quarantined, so to say, on this planet, uh, are able to transcend these limitations and uh, sort of explore the universe with our mind. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so that is, a, in a sense, is something perhaps uh, useful to remember these days that in the end, the human mind can transcend uh, so many of these uh, limitations and so, uh, that circumstances uh, uh, put on us, and that's uh, something inspiring. So, uh, so um, Hawking's work can be viewed as part of the, the journey of physics, of modern physics, uh, as something which has actually, uh, which will take us, we'll see from the very, very large scales, like I mentioned, the, the scale of the universe, and so on, but interestingly, also to the very, very small scales. And, um, and uh, so this journey, uh, let me kind of put it in a, a larger uh, picture. Uh, the physical, what, are, what is the aim of physics? The aim of uh, physical laws is to understand the regularities and the underlying patterns in nature. Uh, we started, humans started by figuring out how things fall and then how things move uh, when you uh, push them and so on, so forth, uh, how a pendulum sort of oscillates, etc. Uh, from basic things in around us, uh, people try to formulate precise mathematical laws, which we all learn in school, high school physics. Uh, and uh, But this process of understanding the patterns of nature actually continues to hold even as we widen the scope of these laws from far outside our experience uh, uh, to regimes very far removed, the very, very large and the very, very small, like I was saying. Um, so uh, it's quite remarkable that we have been able to capture uh, these patterns in precise mathematical terms. Uh, and so that's been the quest of physics to enlarge the scope of these laws. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this uh, journey about, uh, of which we can talk a lot about, uh, but I will focus on one particular aspect of this journey, uh, which is to do with the force of gravity, which is in some sense uh, something all of us uh, know and can sort of almost feel in our bones, I say. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so gravity in that sense is the most visible force in nature, even a tiny toddler, uh, while trying to sort of uh, make his or her first uh, step, uh, uh, immediately senses the force of gravity, is able, is trying to overcome it. Uh, uh, and uh, so it's something very uh, ubiquitous. Uh, all of us uh, encounter it. Uh, but Newton, and it was uh, Newton's genius, that he realized that one could formulate a law for this gravitational force, and moreover, that it applied not only on Earth, but on a universal scale, at least the universe as he knew it at that time. Uh, and this is the, the famous law of Newton's, which uh, we all study in school, uh, about uh, the inverse square law. Um, uh, so this is something uh, you're all familiar with. The, uh, I'll just remind you that G is the so-called Newton's constant, which measures the strength of the gravitational force between two bodies, and uh, M1 and M2 are the two masses. And this is the law which governs the planets on our, in our solar system very well. Uh, and in fact, uh, to this day, even uh, space scientists, uh, like the ones who are designing uh, the trajectories for Mangalyan or, and so on, are using essentially Newton's laws. Uh, and they work remarkably well uh, within the solar system and the uh, environment uh, that we normally, uh, uh, that in a sense was the extent of Newton's understanding of the universe. Uh, but uh, when we go to the very, very large, even larger scales, uh, as I said, the solar system is just a tiny little uh, stellar uh, system near uh, in the outskirts of the Milky Way, uh, and the universe is immensely larger, as we will see. Uh, so what we learn is that the universe has extreme phenomena uh, when, we, uh, when we explore at the largest scales, and Newton's law is actually only approximately true, and in many cases, in fact, uh, very far from being true. Uh, and uh, so this was a very successful law, but it applies within 
uh, within a certain domain. Uh, it's um, and I'll say a little bit more about what that domain is as we uh, uh, go along. Uh, but uh, but the important thing to sort of appreciate is how one went from terrestrial sort of experience and uh, was able successfully to expand it uh, to a bigger domain. And but then people pushed it further and further, and this is what uh, we have been doing. The uh, the understanding that uh, uh, Newton had of the force of gravity was sort of turned up on its head in some sense by Einstein, uh, uh, who who actually came up with a radically different picture of the force of gravity. What he actually said uh, can be kind of, if you want to encapsulate it in a slogan, it is just that gravity is geometry. Uh, and uh, let me say a few words about that. Uh, uh, so um, uh, what he meant to say was the force that we see as the force of gravity is essentially a manifestation of the geometry of space and time. That space and when there are massive bodies like the earth in this picture here, when there are massive bodies, they affect the geometry around them in such a way that it curves the geometry in a particular, in a very specific way, such that objects moving in the vicinity of that, of that, uh, of the earth, the, like the satellite over here, they feel this geometry and they move according to the laws of motion on a curved geometry. Uh, and those are what we see, uh, what we, uh, uh, those, those are uh, the laws of motion in a curved geometry uh, of space time actually appear to us like the elliptical orbits or the circular orbits that we would uh, normally study in uh, using Newton's laws. But there's, a, there's an entirely new perspective now uh, on gravity. Moreover, uh, and quite remarkably, Einstein wrote these equations. You see the picture of Einstein in the top right corner. Uh, he gave precise equations for describing the geometry uh, of uh, the space time. And quite remarkably, he realized that in a certain limit, the, you recover the same picture that Newton had, uh, but uh, that is only in a certain limiting case. Uh, in, in, um, when things are uh, more extreme, for instance, when the velocities are very large compared to the, comparable to the speed of light, then Newton's laws are not a good description at all. And it's Einstein's curved space geometry that gives the most more um, uh, gives a more um, more accurate picture, and this has by now been experimentally verified in many uh, in many uh, instances in many different situations. Uh, so uh, so Newton's law, in some sense, was sort of expanded by Einstein. As I said, he overhauled the very framework for describing gravity, and. Uh, and tied it up with the geometry of space and time. So one of the remarkable things here was, um, and this is why Einstein was so revolutionary, uh, in uh, that he brought about a completely different view of our picture of space and time. We, uh, even now, most of us, we view space, I mean, the space in, around us and the time through which we live. Uh, we view those as some kind of the stage on which all the other stuff happens. The, uh, so uh, the space is space. I mean, you have up, down, top, left, right, et cetera. But, uh, and, and that's, you think of that as just a stage on which all the physical events happen. And that's how physicists, uh, since Newton uh, had viewed it. But uh, Einstein uh, uh, realized that the space-time becomes an active participant because it responds to the content. So as I showed in the previous picture, kind of a caricature of that uh, 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 effect is that the more heavy an object, the more dense an object, it curves the space-time around it in a, in a very specific way. And so in that sense, the space-time is responding to the, the contents. It's as if you had a stage in which, depending on what the actors on the stage were doing, the stage itself was becomes a kind of uh, uh, is is uh, uh, changes and uh, changes its mood or changes its uh, colors and 
and so on and so forth. If you were in a sort of a, uh, uh, if you can imagine a sort of a, a reactive uh, stage of that kind. So, um, so that uh, that was a very novel insight of Einstein uh, to um, uh, to view uh, space time in this way. Uh, <coughs> a second. Um, uh, so you might ask, okay, but Newton's laws were good enough. I mean, we are sending uh, satellites to uh, uh, around the Earth or even uh, things to Mars and other planets. Uh, we, uh, we are doing fine with Newton's laws. Why do we need this Einstein's theory? As I said, it's because in the universe, there are very extreme events which we in our little boring corner of the universe don't immediately encounter uh, because there are objects called neutron stars, uh, pulsars. These are very dense objects. A teaspoonful of neutron star material weighs as much as the sun. So it's matter compressed to, some of, to one of its most dense states. And in such a case, uh, Again, I, you realize that Einstein's theory is the correct theory and not, uh, not uh, Newton's uh, theory. And people have measured, uh, have measured and studied the physics near, in the environment of neutron stars and pulsars by now very extensively. So when things are very highly dense, Newton's laws break down. As I said earlier, when things move, uh, at velocities comparable to the speed of light, then Newton's laws break down. So there are many circumstances uh, where these break down, and one of the most uh, uh, one of the most remarkable ones will be black holes, which I will uh, 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 talk about very soon. Uh, and black holes are now things we know are there at various scales. There are stellar black holes. That means. Uh, black holes whose masses are um, a few times the mass of the sun, could be from a couple of times to about even 30 times the mass of the sun, 30 to 50 times the mass of the sun, to galactic black holes, which can have, which are typically at the center of galaxies. In, in, in fact, the Milky Way also has a black hole at its center. And these have masses from a few million black times the mass of the sun, to a few billion times the mass of the sun. So humongous black holes. Uh, and these are things that have been detected. So, uh, so we'll come to black holes and their properties uh, uh, very soon. But I wanted to mention that uh, you might think, OK, these are some extreme events out there in the universe. But actually, remarkably, even far on down to Earth, for some uh, the, the, the Einstein's prediction of the geometry of space and time being curved means that there's an effect called the gravitational slowing down of time, uh, which happens, uh, even, which can be, which is measurable even when you go from the surface of the Earth to a satellite, which is a few uh, hundred kilometers or thousand kilometers above the, uh, above the Earth. And there's a there's a time difference at rate at which clocks move on the satellite versus the Earth. And since all our modern GPS systems in our uh, phones uh, have to do with uh, um, the signals sent from Earth to satellites and how they're triangulated, uh, knowing that uh, if you want to pinpoint uh, accuracy to even a few meters, uh, you need to take into account these corrections due to Einstein's uh, picture, the gravitational slowing down of time, uh, because the time, the, uh, the way it, uh, uh, the clocks move is different in a gravitational field. So uh, this is an effect that people have to actually take into account. So even uh, something so seemingly so esoteric at first has down to earth consequences. And uh, right now, in fact, Einstein's picture of gravity in terms of geometry has given us a very successful description of the universe and its evolution from the very early moments near the so-called Big Bang uh, to the present day. And so at the very largest scales of the universe with, and, and the largest scales which we have explored uh, as a species, 
is about a million times the size of the Milky Way. So Milky Way is itself quite mind boggling uh, for people because you know the solar system itself is just a tiny speck in the Milky Way. And we are talking now of things a million times of the size of the Milky Way. And this picture is a picture of uh, after its impression of some galaxies. Uh, uh, and these galaxies actually form clusters and there are super clusters. So the universe is sort of uh, structured and textured at, at much bigger scales than uh, we uh, than uh, we might at first think, and um, uh, Einstein's theory gives up gives a very good description. So you might think, okay, yeah, I mean, to the extent that we have managed to describe uh, the universe to these very large scales, Einstein's theory seems to be very good. So we are done. Um, but actually, no, and that's the uh, re remarkable thing in the journey of physics that one sees. Uh, Einstein's theory itself throws up some puzzles, and this is what I'll come to next. And, but maybe this is a good point to sort of break and ask if people uh, uh, people have any quick uh, things to clarify. Hi, Rajesh. This is a, in the Q&A. There is a question by Srinivasa uh, Sekar. He asks, what exactly is meant by space-time curvature in terms of equations and math? <laughs> in words, but more precisely, what does it mean that space-time is curved by gravity? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's of course uh, difficult for me to explain in a, in a few words uh, that, um, uh, what it is like. But uh, to just give you a rough picture, you know, in two dimensions, if you just take a, uh, uh, a piece of paper, which is flat uh, like this, you, uh, you describe things in terms of Euclidean geometry, you have the sum of the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees and all the things that you learn in high school geometry. But now if I were to curve this uh, uh, paper in some way, um, then, and I draw the analog of triangles on it, uh, the, uh, the triangles, the sum of the angles of a triangle actually will no longer be necessarily uh, 180, depending on whether it's positively curved like a sphere, it can be greater than 180. If it is negatively curved like a saddle, it can be um, it can be less than 180. So, uh, in, so this is an uh, this is a, a case in two dimensions, which is easy to visualize. Two-dimensional geometry, which is curved. Now, four-dimensional geometry, which is curved, is more difficult to visualize. Uh, the four dimensions of space and time together. Um, uh, but nevertheless, it can be done in terms of equations very similar to those you use uh, for describing two dimensional curvature. Um, uh, generalizing that it was done by the German mathematician Riemann. Uh, and there are precise equations uh, which tell you how to describe the um, uh, curvature in terms of. Uh, the way in which you measure distances locally, uh, what is called the metric. So in terms of taking derivatives of the metric, you can define the second derivative defines a curvature. And it, Einstein's equations essentially relate that curvature to the energy and the mass in the space time, the mass density and the energy density. And these are very precise equations and you can uh, look them up in the internet or in some of the introductory books on general relativity. Uh, and uh, these, that's how um, you quantitatively describe the curvature and uh, describe how uh, something, uh, the, how, uh, how much curvature will be there around a given body like the earth or the sun. There is another question. I guess you can take it on, uh, take it up later if you want to. Uh, Nitish asks, can you please explain about black hole jets? Yeah, I, I have not yet talked about black holes and I probably may not talk about black hole jets, but I'll be happy to answer later. Yeah. And finally, there is, uh, uh, Arvind is asking, so are you saying that time on a GPS satellite goes faster than on Earth? That would affect GPS accuracy. Could you shed some light on how that is I don't, uh, how that is corrected for. Yeah, so you know, uh, so the point is that you know that the clock on Earth goes slightly slower compared to the clock uh, on the satellite. And you know by how much. It's something like one factor, one in 10 to the nine. And there's a kind of, a, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, it's a factor of one in 10 to the nine. 
and um, uh, and so you know how much it should be and so you can correct for that uh, uh, and uh, that's how i think people take it into account okay uh, so uh, so let me proceed as i said einstein's theory seems very successful but there are puzzles and and it's black holes which is uh, which i'll now talk to which uh, really exemplified those puzzles, and this is where, uh, in a sense, uh, Hawking's work uh, will come to center stage. <clears throat> so um, black holes are, in some ways, they were predictions of Einstein's theory. They are some of, they are one of its most enigmatic predictions because even now, after more than a century uh, of them being uh, uh, predicted, we have still not understood. And their properties in detail. So people are still sort of uh, uh, are trying to figure out uh, uh, the consequences of this prediction. So, uh, uh, but in the universe out there, uh, how, where do you see these black holes? Uh, the first uh, place, I mean, for people first wrote down uh, these uh, as uh, solutions from Einstein's equations. Uh, but I think it was the it were when people in astrophysics tried to study the what happens when a star becomes so uh, ma uh, so dense that there's nothing that can overcome its gravitational pull because gravity is always attractive. Now, in a typical star, there are uh, like the sun, there are uh, other chemical processes, nuclear processes. Uh, going on which generate uh, energy and therefore a pressure uh, uh, which sort of pushes the balances the pull of the gravity but when stars die out when their nuclear fusion processes uh, get extinguished then eventually they collapse and they collapse first to things called white dwarfs and neutron stars uh, and eventually, and this was realized by Chandrasekhar, uh, that the, the gravitational field is so strong that there's probably no, uh, nothing that can resist its gravitational collapse. Uh, and, um, uh, and the end point is likely to be something where uh, uh, the space time is so curved that even light cannot escape from beyond a certain radius. Uh, so these, uh, so in a sense, it's you can think of it as if the space time has sort of bottomed out into a kind of uh, infinite tube uh, uh, or a very long tube. So that uh, um, uh, I showed you earlier the picture of the Earth, and it was sort of gently curving the space time. But imagine if it curved much more dramatically, which would happen when things are very dense. Then uh, the curvature would be so strong that light which tries to go in a straight line in that curved geometry will not be able to escape and will sort of get trapped inside. Uh, and this is, the, I, uh, this is what happens in uh, a black hole and you can mathematically understand uh, that from the geometry of its uh, space and time, that there is this region which will be important for us so uh, please keep this in mind that there'll be there's a region called the horizon and you might have heard of this as a horizon something a sphere of a particular radius which is proportional to the mass uh, of the object beyond which light cannot escape so in the simplest case it's sort of a sphere or an ellipsoid uh, beyond which uh, from behind which light cannot escape which is why the name black hole comes because, uh, and this is what this artist's impression of this picture, uh, which actually shows some of these jets uh, that someone asked about. Uh, uh, so you see the black uh, thing in the middle, it's supposed to be an artist's impression of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the tiny region below, beyond which light cannot escape. Uh, uh, so this horizon and it's, it's the, ra the radius, as I said, is something proportional to the mass it's sometimes called the Schwarzschild radius after the uh, astronomer who discovered uh, this solution of Einstein's equation. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so people uh, felt this was a possibility, but uh, it's of course very difficult to see something from which light cannot escape, but it's almost an oxymoron. 
Um, so people actually initially deduced the existence of these objects from uh, cases like that shown in the uh, picture here, where there was two objects, there was a star which seemed to be losing matter, which seemed, matter seemed to be getting sucked out from it and getting spiraling into some object nearby, which clearly had a mass, but was uh, so dense uh, and, and didn't really seem to have a structure. Uh, so this was first noticed in particular star, the Cygnus X1 and so on. And gradually, oh, this was in the 70s and people found more and more examples. Uh, but remarkably, in the last five years, uh, we've uh, seen more direct evidence of these gravitational waves, first from this so-called LIGO detection, which is the topic, can be the topic of another fascinating talk. Um, uh, the LIGO observatory uh, with detected gravitational waves that come when two black holes collide and they could recreate the picture and that's the picture in the middle here of two black holes sort of colliding and sending out ripples in space-time which can be measured. Uh, these ripples are uh, show up in, uh, in these very sensitive detectors and last year we had uh, the so-called Event Horizon Telescope, which was a radio telescope uh, set up across uh, uh, with uh, a whole network of radio telescopes around the world, which imaged the black hole at the center of the uh, M87 galaxy. Uh, and, um, uh, it, um, uh, and this picture was uh, sort of a rendition of that uh, image. Uh, though that wasn't actually in radio uh, wavelength, uh, but uh, uh, but you could, they could see a very clear evidence of a structure which mapped, uh, matched with uh, the uh, with uh, you know, what you would predict for the environment around the black hole. I must say these were actually it was remarkable because within five years you got these two different evidence, and these are for two different kinds of black holes. The black holes uh, that LIGO detected, which the middle picture shows are stellar black holes, as I said, they're about tens of solar masses. Whereas the picture that the Event Horizon Telescope mapped is that at the center of a galaxy, uh, and uh, that particular one is a few billion light, uh, masses of the sun, a few billion times solar mass. So, uh, so you had these, uh, uh, so now we have very direct evidence for these. So why are these black holes so important? And why did I say that they are uh, and this thing. Firstly, they're very special solutions. They're sort of the uh, very um, highly symmetric uh, solutions of Einstein's equations. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and when I um, uh, mean they're uh, highly symmetric, uh, it's, uh, it's remarkable because they are completely specified once I tell you what the mass of the black hole is and what, how much its angular momentum or its spin is. Uh, uh, how fast it is essentially rotating. Uh, so just those two numbers uh, essentially capture the properties of the black hole. Uh, the geometry is completely specified once I know this, and you can show that, uh, uh, that uh, the black hole's just geometry, uh, you just need to give uh, some of these numbers and in very, um, perhaps also some electric charge, but that's very, unlikely, um, uh, but uh, they are essentially highly symmetric special solutions. Uh, and um, moreover, they have this funny thing. I mentioned this horizon beyond which light doesn't uh, escape, from behind which light doesn't escape. But behind that horizon, the space-time itself uh, in some ways ends. Um, there is something called a singularity, uh, which people still don't completely understand. It's a place where Einstein's equations breaks down because the curvature that I mentioned earlier becomes infinite. And in some sense, the Einstein equations stop making sense there. Um, so, so the Einstein's equations predict this solution, which is very beautiful, has these uh, very unique characteristics, uh, and which has been experimentally observed. But in some sense, Einstein's equations also tell you that something must give inside this black hole. We don't understand what's really happening inside because there is something like, there is bound to be a singularity. 
so people were very puzzled by this, but, but in the 1960s, and this was before black holes were even experimentally detected, people thought, okay, that's just some special solution of Einstein's equations. It will not be in any actual system, which is actually formed from a star. A star is a much more messy object. It's not going to settle into something very symmetric and so on. It will, there will be probably all kinds of other things and that singularity is more a consequence, an artifact of the kind of uh, very special solution, symmetric solution you're taking. But the Hawking's first work for which he became famous uh, was a work that he did both by himself and together with Penrose in his thesis, uh, as part of his thesis in 1968, which showed that in any collapse, um, generically you will have a singularity. So the singularity is inevitable, that Einstein's equations will uh, inevitably, uh, when you let things evolve in time, they will inevitably have a singularity. And even something like the Big Bang, uh, which also has a similar singularity, that's unavoidable. It's nothing to do with some very symmetric solution. It will always be essentially there. And this was very eye-opening or kind of just changed people's way of thinking about it and made people realize that you have to sort of address this problem that there is some, that Einstein's equations stop making sense at some point and therefore there is a puzzle there to understand what happens, why is, what does it mean that space-time ends and there is a singularity. I want to mention over here uh, sort of an unsung hero of Indian science, um, uh, Amal Rai Chaudhary, who taught at Presidency College in Kolkata uh, and um, in fact was the mentor for many brilliant physicists. Uh, uh, he, his work in the 1950s uh, on something called the Rai Chaudhary equation uh, which tells you that gravity, in gravity, things must inevitably focus. This was used critically by Hawking and Penrose in their work. So uh, this is a person you don't normally hear so much about, but uh, he, it's seminal work, which even now continues to play a role in our understanding of Einstein's theory. <laughs> so, so Hawking, as I said, uh, in a way, burst on the scene with a bang, uh, or a big bang, uh, with, uh, uh, with his work uh, on singularities. But uh, he then discovered something, uh, he sort of his, uh, focused his attention on the horizon. I mean, so he showed that singularities are inevitable, etc. But then he actually realized that there were some remarkable features about even the black hole horizon. So the singularity is something hidden perhaps deep inside the black hole and you might not immediately access it. But the horizon is the interface of the black hole with the rest of the universe. That's the place that you see that something um, that beyond which light is not escaping. So that's uh, sort of the boundary of the accessible part of the black hole. What he realized is that Einstein's equations predict that the area of this horizon, I told you that it was like a sphere with some radius, this area will always increase. It can never decrease. Uh, uh, so it can't happen that a black hole will split up into two smaller black holes and its area will decrease. Uh, in fact, black holes can only eat up each other and grow. They are like monsters that uh, sort of whose size only keeps increasing, uh, they, they can never shrink uh, and disappear. Uh, at least that's what Einstein's equations uh, tell you. And uh, together with uh, two other physicists, he developed what were called the four laws of black hole mechanics, which had to do with the properties of the black hole horizon. And actually they were called the four laws of black hole mechanics because there was was a bit like the four laws of thermodynamics. And they noticed that there was an analogy, a very compelling analogy with the laws of thermodynamics. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so this was firstly very strange, but perhaps many of you are more familiar with the laws of thermodynamics. It is something you might have studied in, uh, even in, as an engineer, you, uh, uh, you uh, all of us take uh, courses on thermodynamics. And, uh, and um, uh, so it's the basis of the heat engines and everything. 
So uh, you may know that the first law of thermodynamics is essentially the law of conservation of energy. Uh, uh, it, uh, you might have seen delta E is T delta S plus P delta V. But anyway, the form doesn't matter. What will be actually important is the so-called second law of thermodynamics, which uh, is something that you may be familiar with. It's the law, or law which essentially tells you that entropy, uh, which is a thermodynamic uh, concept, uh, always increases in the universe. And this is something all of us are familiar with. I mean, our deaths uh, uh, only increase in clutter as time goes by. Uh, and uh, our, whole, uh, our uh, homes, our offices, unless we put in an active effort to, of course, reduce the entropy, but which in the process, of course, you, uh, you sweat a lot and then you sort of are, uh, uh, increase your own entropy. But anyhow, uh, uh, the entropy, the net entropy in the universe keeps increasing. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Entropy is a more uh, um, technical concept, which is uh, tr which tries to capture the notion of disorder. It tries to tell you how much, uh, uh, how many different ways a thing can, how many different configurations a, a system can take. So a high entropy system is one in which things can be take many, many different, uh, uh, um, uh, there can be many, many different configurations giving rise to the same uh, overall uh, system. A low entropy system is a very ordered system like, um, like in a magnet or something where things are always, point, all the individual atoms inside the magnet are kind of lined up and all pointing in some direction. That's a very ordered state. Uh, whereas, uh, uh, whereas when the magnet gets demagnetized, all the magnets can point in any which direction. There's no net magnetic uh, uh, field, uh, uh, but there are many, many different individual atoms all pointing in different directions. And so there, uh, it's a highly disordered system. Uh, so entropy is, uh, is a measure of disorder. Uh, so what uh, uh, um, Hawking observed was this area increase theorem was a bit like the entropy increase theorem of thermodynamics. So if it was just one such thing, of course, people would say, okay, uh, many things increase. I mean, uh, your weight increases all the time and you, you don't know much, but that doesn't mean that uh, your weight has to do with uh, the horizon of a black hole. Uh, though perhaps in some cases it has, but uh, anyhow, uh, the, um, uh, the, but what uh, with Bardeen and Carter, he found that there were analogies to the other laws of thermodynamics as well. The first law of thermodynamics, which is, uh, like I said, about the conservation of energy. Uh, there's, uh, and similarly, the sec uh, second law that I mentioned, the third law about um, um, uh, the uh, behavior of the entropy at zero temperature and so on. So, um, so there were analogies to all the laws, uh, and that was quite remarkable. But but at the first uh, first glance, that looks very strange because thermodynamics means you have to have a temperature. Uh, and I just told you that, uh, in fact, what, uh, if you took this analogy seriously, the acceleration due to gravity at the horizon uh, would play the role of the temperature of a black hole. That looks crazy. Why does acceleration have anything to do with temperature? Uh, and so in what sense can it be a real temperature? Uh, and besides, a hot body, a body which has temperature, is radiating. It radiates energy and loses energy to its surroundings. Um, but we but we have just been talking about black holes not being able to radiate or have any uh, radiation as after all quanta of light, uh, 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 of electromagnetic radiation that uh, cannot escape black holes. So what is happening? I mean, this is this is some just a silly analogy, just some uh, correspondence. Uh, of course, and in fact, Hawking believed for a while that it was just a, a silly correspondence. Though there were other people like Beckenstein uh, in Israel, who uh, at that time in the U.S., who well, uh, who thought it was uh, perhaps more than an analogy. But Hawking wanted to prove that it just can't make sense. So he um, uh, so he investigated this in detail, uh, and that 
brings us now to the last part of the story and uh, the sort of Hawking's great work. Uh, but before that, I'll quickly stop if there are any immediate questions. Yeah, so there have been lots of uh, questions that have been posted on this Q&A. So I'll... Uh, uh, just something immediate, to, I mean, anything to do with the topic that I just... Or uh, a few of the questions. So, uh, uh, <laughs> how, uh, so Nitish is asking, how does black hole form uh, relativistic jets if nothing comes out of the black hole? So maybe I'll uh, just remind me to address this at the end. But yeah, uh, it's not coming out of the black hole. It's coming only from the quick answers. It's coming only from the environment around the black hole. It's not coming from the black hole from inside the black hole. He also asks, does black holes have uh, harmonic vibrations? Uh, yes, and I'll talk about that later. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I can answer. And finally, there is another question by Aditya. Is there any evidence to show conservation of mass does not hold as a black hole gobbles of matter? No, I'm not, I'm, we don't see any evidence for that. Mass, if you understand in terms of mass and energy, in fact, when those two black holes in LIGO collided, it was actually, one was something like 35 solar masses and the other was um, uh, 29, uh, about 30 solar masses. Uh, and the final black hole had 62 solar masses. So you might have thought, oh, the mass has decreased. But actually the three solar masses were radiated away in radiation. So you know that energy and mass are interchangeable by Einstein's uh, relation. So, uh, if you uh, include that, then uh, uh, there is no uh, no uh, no evidence for any non-conservation. There's another question. Nitish says that he has read in Hawking's book that when black hole A and black hole B combine, they will give a black hole C, which has a larger area than black hole A and B combined. How and why? So I guess this is about the second law of thermodynamics. That is the second law of thermodynamics, and you can actually work it out. Uh, actually, if you are, uh, uh, this is a simple thing I've given you actually. Uh, most of the information needed for that. I told you that the radius of the horizon of a black hole is proportional to the mass. So if you can imagine, let's say, uh, two, two bodies each with mass m and uh, two each of mass m, and therefore some radius r, the area is proportional to the square of the radius. Now you bring the two masses together, it becomes a black hole of two times the mass. Uh, and work out its area, you will see that it's actually twice the area of the original uh, black hole. Uh, so the area is always increasing. So you can work it out using the relation between the area and uh, between the area and the radius, which is four pi r square, and the fact that the uh, um, uh, fact that the uh, uh, mass is proportional to the radius. So in fact, there's an, uh, an interesting question. I guess uh, you can take it up later as well. So Ashok asks, is it area or volume? So I, I guess this is more profound than... Uh, <laughs> what yeah, uh, so that is actually, that's something I will talk about uh, soon, uh, but ask me later as well. But that's definitely one of the very remarkable features of this formula, uh, that it's proportional to the area and not the volume. Uh, so, uh, uh, okay, so uh, to let me, uh, in trying to explain Hawking's um, uh, most profound result, let me bring in a third component, I mean, well, another pillar actually of our understanding of modern physics, which I have not talked about so far, and you might have even wondered why, I mean, I talked about Einstein's theory of gravity, which is about the quantum nature that uh, really underlies all reality as we now understand it. Uh, in particular, the existence of atoms is due to the quantum nature or the wave-like nature of the constituent particles, namely electrons, protons, etc. And this picture at the very small scales from the atomic scale downwards is uh, something that we uh, have now tested very well. And we know that there is a, a light also has a quantum nature and therefore Though that's the uh, origin of the term photon coined by Einstein, uh, that uh, there's a quantum uh, particle-like nature. Uh, and in fact, there's a little cartoon that I'd uh, like to show, which illustrates this duality, this duality between waves and particles. So you see light is a particle. If you, uh, uh, I hope most of you can read that if you look at it one way, it says particle, but if you look at it another way, it says wave. 
uh, and the particle is a little more difficult to read, but you can see it's sort of, uh, 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 if you break it up, it's uh, really uh, there. So, but you can't see both particle and wave at the same time, right? In that, uh, uh, you can, if you see particle, then you don't see wave. If you see wave, you don't see particle. Uh, uh, so it's a bit like that. Uh, um, uh, with quantum mechanics. And uh, this is really the underpinning, in fact, of uh, much of modern electronics and gadgetry. I think uh, many people uh, forget that all the things that we have around us, computers, smartphones, touch screens, what have you, uh, um, uh, GPSs uh, and uh, lasers, all of it has its origin from the laws of quantum mechanics. If we didn't know the laws of quantum mechanics, as we didn't about uh, before 1925 in some sense, uh, we wouldn't have had any of these objects. It, it's uh, it, uh, it, the underpinning of all of um, modern technology is, is quantum mechanics. And in some, some estimation, 30% of the US GDP is based on the laws of quantum mechanics. So I just put that out there to sort of make uh, bring home to people the importance of understanding the fundamental laws of physics uh, from a purely even a pragmatic or uh, the same point of view. Uh, so this microcosmos, I talked uh, so far about the macrocosmos, but the microcosmos, uh, quantum mechanics uh, uh, applies, this describes in fact all the other forces of nature, the electromagnetic, the weak and strong interactions. Uh, all the way to distances about a billion times smaller than an atom now. So at the atomic scales were what uh, people wanted to describe phenomena and came up with the laws of quantum mechanics about a century ago. But now in accelerators like this uh, one near, this is the sun, this is a picture of the, well, it's not a picture of the accelerator, it's a, the circle that you see is a picture of the underground uh, 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 below that circle. Underground is this uh, uh, is this humongous accelerator, which uh, was in the news for finding the Higgs boson and so on. You can see the Geneva Airport uh, uh, runway there as uh, to give you a scale of uh, how big that collider is. But it's it, this huge colliders that you can actually probe distances right now all the way to a billion times smaller than an atom and the laws of quantum mechanics hold incredibly well all the way there. So uh, this, is, uh, this is, as I said, a pillar of our modern understanding of uh, nature. So you might think, uh, I told you about these two different things. One was gravity and a very large scale, and then there's quantum mechanics, and they seem to be like worlds apart. Uh, and indeed, Einstein's theory is in some sense what we now call a classical theory. Something like Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism is a purely classical description. And Einstein's theory is in some ways a more complicated version of Maxwell's equations. Maxwell's equations tell you what the electric and magnetic fields are once you have currents and charges. But uh, Einstein's theory tells you what the um, uh, what the geometry is once you have masses and energy. So Mass and energy plays the similar role as energy, as currents and charges, and uh, and just like the uh, just like the uh, electric and magnetic fields, you sort of have uh, the geometry is described by, in a sense, a metric field, um, and it's a very it's a classical description in terms of partial differential equations, if you want to think of it mathematically. Uh, so there are no quantum effects in it, and. Uh, uh, so you can ask what happens if we consider a black hole in a quantum world. I mean, if you don't, if you pretend that the world is, uh, I mean, so far we were pretending that the world is classical and only the laws of Einstein describe how things uh, evolve. But if you, and this is what Hawking essentially did, you just, uh, 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 it's, um, you, you, you assume, I mean, you just take a little baby step into the quantum world by saying that uh, what happens if the environment around is a black hole is described by the laws of quantum mechanics? How would, uh, how, what would change from what you studied earlier? And Hawking did this to kind of show that they're, uh, in fact, to try to disprove this idea of Bekenstein that black holes can radiate 
and he found to his surprise that black holes indeed radiate. Uh, they, uh, they have a temperature and an entropy. Uh, so this was a complete surprise. Uh, actually, I should backtrack a bit. Bekenstein uh, had proposed that there would be an entropy, but he didn't uh, think of it having a temperature. What Hawking found was that actually there is a temperature and he gave a precise formula for this temperature. And I, that's one of the equations I wanted to show because uh, it's a very beautiful formula for the simplest uh, uh, kind of black hole. You might remember I introduced the symbol G earlier, the Newton's constant of gravitation. Uh, that's what determines the gravitational force that's there even in the Einstein's theory. Uh, it's uh, the basic uh, underlying uh, uh, physical constant uh, for uh, gravity. And M is the mass. And then there is this H bar, which is actually the Planck's constant on the, in the numerator. Uh, and this is a signature of the quantum effect. If this was not there, the temperature would be zero. So this is a purely quantum effect. And so that's why the Planck's constant uh, which is a measure of quantumness uh, enters into this formula. This is sort of for the simplest kind of black hole. And there's a similar um, formula for the entropy, which is actually turns out to be proportional to the area. Again, like we discussed, the area was what was in increasing just like the entropy. And now Hawking is telling us that it's not just an analogy. The black hole does have an entropy, uh, which uh, is given by a very precise formula. It's not just uh, an analogy. There is a precise formula which tells you that the entropy of a black hole is equal to its area divided by uh, the Planck's constant and this Newton's constant. And this area, as I said, is proportional to the mass, uh, I mean, the um, uh, square of the mass. Uh, and uh, so it's a very definite uh, uh, formula. Uh, and um, uh, so, uh, so he uh, he realized that it's uh, that you can uh, that he found that if you include quantum effects, black holes do have a temperature and uh, uh, a radiate. So uh, something that's very puzzling. Uh, there are many things that are puzzling with this formula, and someone already uh, uh, raised this uh, because entropy is something which normally arises from the underlying internal structure, like when there are molecules of gas in a jar and you study entropy in a thermodynamics course, uh, you realize that the entropy is proportional to the volume, but more, more fundamentally, it's, um, it comes from the number of different states that the underlying uh, gas, uh, mole uh, the gas can take, the molecules of the gas can take. And you, in fact, uh, the precise formula is that you take the log of the number of states and that gives you the area. And um, so Hawking's result is astonishing for a number of reasons. Firstly, uh, the fact that it is non-zero uh, 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 because I told you earlier that in a black hole in Einstein's theory has no internal structure. It's very unique. So you cannot say that it's not like molecules of gas in a jar because then there are lots of molecules they can be moving all over the jar and that's why there are many different states a molecule can be at a given temperature and volume uh, uh, but uh, for a black hole if i tell you its mass there's just one uh, and maybe it's angular momentum there's essentially a unique state uh, which is the one that's given by einstein's uh, the solution of Einstein's equations. So you would have thought the number of states is one and log of one is zero. So entropy should be zero. Uh, and so it's surprising that there's a non-zero answer for, uh, uh, for, um, um, uh, for the entropy that Hawking found. Uh, so that's uh, surprise number one. Surprise number two is that if it were non-zero, you would have thought at least it should be proportional to the volume like someone asked but it's instead proportional to the area. And that is again very puzzling because there is no thermodynamic system we normally encounter in which the entropy is not extensive. The entropy always grows with the volume because the number of states grows exponentially with the volume and therefore the log of it will be always proportional to the volume. Uh, so there's something that we, Einstein's theory would be, is unable to account for this entropy. 
So only a quantum theory of gravity, which describes gravity completely in a quantum level, can give the underlying states of a black hole. Because what Hawking actually found his um, a formula, not by considering a full-fledged quantum theory of gravity. As I said, he just considered what a black hole would do in the environment of, uh, uh, in a quantum environment. But he didn't really study the black hole itself uh, as a fundamentally quantum object. So this uh, only a quantum theory of gravity can do, and it's a challenge. So Hawking's formula immediately throws up a challenge for a quantum theory of gravity, which is to account for this very strange formula that the entropy is proportional to the area with this proportionality factor. And this is, as I said, something that any quantum pro gravity proposal ought to meet. It's, it's in a sense, the benchmark for uh, seeing whether you have a viable theory of quantum gravity. It has to account for all these microstates of a black hole. You have to be able to count the number of different states, take its logarithm, and account for this entropy. Uh, and that's what I have just said. Um, and so this is a, this is a sort of a challenge. And um, you, I mean, you or I, if you we want to come up with a new quantum theory of gravity. One of the first things that we need to, uh, to, to do is to figure out whether we can, uh, we can reproduce this uh, answer of Hawking from a microscopic point of view, namely by counting the microstates. Uh, let me remind you that that was one of the successes of the atomic theory uh, in accounting for the entropy of gases and so on. All the thermodynamics that we study uh, uh, is actually de well described, well uh, described by the atomic um, uh, theory of the gases that the gases are made of molecules uh, in, a, of, uh, in a particular way, and that's uh, that accounts for all the thermodynamics we uh, we study. So similarly, we need an atomic theory, so to say, of gravity, which will account for uh, this entropy. So I'll say a little bit in the final closing this thing off about string theory. String theory is a framework for quantum gravity in which the basic objects are one dimensional uh, extended objects, spring like objects, rubber band like closed springs or sort of uh, uh, thread uh, just open ended uh, strings. Um, and um, among the early successes of string theory was the fact that it could account for the quantum of gravitation just like the photon is the quantum for electromagnetism, the graviton, which is the analogous quantum, could be accounted for uh, by string theory and its interactions were of the right kind. Uh, but um, really, I think the, the strong test that uh, string theory passed uh, as a viable theory of quantum gravity was that it could capture the entropy of a large class of black holes and exactly reproduce this Hawking's answer with the factor of four that was there uh, and everything. And moreover, it predicts very systematic corrections to it, which can also be compared. Uh, uh, and um, uh, systematic corrections, the uh, Hawking's formula is strictly speaking true for a very large black hole with a very large area. So there are corrections which are sort of uh, to that answer and you can, you can work those out. And the string theory is very successful in doing all that. So you might think, okay, I've now told you about the need for a quantum theory of gravity, but uh, uh, of, um, that we needed for understanding black holes. But you might think, okay, that's something very special. But actually, it's also necessary to understand the birth of the universe because, uh, in some ways, all the galaxies and everything that we see today arose from initial quantum fluctuations at the time of the Big Bang. So it's a rather remarkable fact that all the structure that we see in the universe today, um, uh, which is uh, which um, uh, uh, which both in terms of uh, the distribution of galaxies uh, and in the so-called cosmic microwave background. Um, these are coming from quantum fluctuations at the very early era. Uh, this is the diagram on the left 
shows that uh, you can see sort of on the left side, uh, perhaps you can read it says quantum fluctuations that at the early Big Bang and then the universe expanded and all the structure of the galaxies, uh, etc. Uh, arises from a magnification of those or an amplification of those quantum fluctuations. And the mic the, on the right hand side there are two pictures. The top picture is a picture of the anisotropy of the cosmic microwave background which again shows that there's an overall background of three degree Kelvin radiation coming from the, as a relic of the Big Bang, but there's inhomogeneities and the, the, the brightest, the blue spots are the cooler spots and the yellow ones and are the warmer ones. And so there's one part in 10 to the five inhomogeneities which come from those quantum fluctuations. Similarly, the lower plot has to do with the distribution of matter and uh, not radiation, just matter, the galaxies that we see. And you see the universe is not homogeneously populated. It has all these fibers and it looks a bit like some neuronal structure. Uh, no, so this is the big uh, reconstruction of the universe, the distribution of matter in the universe at the largest scales. And this inhomogeneity again is due to these quantum fluctuations. So we need to understand these quantum fluctuations better to have a full-fledged understanding of the universe as we uh, as it is today starting from uh, the uh, very early era so in a sense we understand quite well things from a little after the big bang so if you assume certain conditions just after the big bang then you can follow through with einstein's equations fairly successfully but that very initial period we don't understand well and that's where we need a theory of quantum gravity. Let me just close by just saying, you know, in uh, Hawking had come to India in 2001 for the string theory conference um, uh, that was held uh, at that time in TIFR in Mumbai. For the first time, it was actually held outside North America and Europe because it was actually a uh, testimony to the fact that India has a very strong presence worldwide in string theory. So, uh, and in fact, I would say that perhaps outside North, outside the United States, India has probably the single most influential community in string theory uh, in any country uh, outside the United States. So, um, so Hawking was there, and this is a picture of him with two other stalwarts of physics, David Gross and Ed Witten, uh, in the uh, at TIFR, and this is a picture. Uh, of a press conference that he addressed at the IFR. Uh, and you can see all the, uh, all the uh, uh, journalists are kind of uh, uh, trying to uh, get, get, uh, get his uh, uh, picture and uh, so on. So he was the center of attraction and this gave a lot of visibility to Indian science at the frontiers. Uh, and uh, so that was, uh, um, uh, uh, I think we were trying to get him in 2015 to Bangalore uh, when he was, uh, when we organized, ICTS uh, uh, organized the um, uh, Springs 2015 conference uh, for the second time it came to India in 2015. We were trying to get him at that time, uh, but unfortunately his health was uh, by then fairly poor and he couldn't travel uh, and uh, so we couldn't uh, have him then. Uh, but um, so let me end uh, by just a sort of uh, 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 inspirational quote from Hawking. I'll just leave it up there. Uh, and uh, uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, it's uh, uh, the fact that Hawking as an individual could overcome the limitations of uh, being in this lockdown state uh, uh, to, to traverse the whole universe. and and in a smaller way, mankind uh, to do the same thing is I think something we should probably keep in the back of our mind. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> so should, should we uh, uh, do with the question answers now? I think yeah. there were a couple of questions that were still left unanswered. So uh, let me just share with you an interesting comment on the chat now how do i see the chat gosh bottom and my screen is at the bottom uh, the chat uh, let's ah, see. Okay. 
So, um, Professor Shorit Kumar Das asks, while there is analogy of black hole dynamics with thermodynamics, the picture shows flow like hydrodynamics. So do we also have an analogy with convective radiative combined heat transfer? Uh, so uh, the first part, could you say again? Uh, why is there? While, while there is analogy of black hole dynamics with thermodynamics, the picture also shows flow like hydrodynamics. So I think this is a black hole hydrodynamics analogy. So do we also have an analogy with convective radiative combined heat transfer? And not, uh, not in a very direct way, I think, uh, because uh, we still don't understand what, I mean, convection requires some motion of uh, um, matter, and we still don't have, in that sense, an understanding of uh, 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 heat transfer between various regions, uh, etc. Uh, but there is an interesting analogy with hydrodynamics, and this is also related to a question people asked about harmonics on uh, black holes. If you kind of throw some matter into a black hole, uh, then what happens? So supposing I just go today and uh, dump all my trash into a black hole. Uh, the trash is just some inhomogeneous set of things. It's not some nice spherical uh, um, uh, set of objects. It's all sorts of junk. It'll go there into the black hole. The black hole will vibrate initially it will have oscillations uh, and these are there are some very specific modes of uh, that will be excited called the quasi normal modes but then it will slowly settle down to a, a final state uh, which is uh, kind of again another black hole horizon which will again be kind of spherical uh, one of the, the geometries that are uh, specified by Einstein's equations uh, so it will uh, slowly relax down to one of these states in the process probably radiating some gravitational energy uh, but uh, uh, but this uh, uh, this fluctuations that are there initially these wobblings can be described as some kind of hydrodynamic ripples also so there is an analogy to hydrodynamics which after all is a sort of the first deviation from thermodynamics or equilibrium uh, in the Q&A, there are a few un unanswered questions. So I'll just uh, take a uh, couple of them. So I think one of them is an interesting one by uh, Srinivasan who asks, I'll paraphrase this question. Uh, he asks whether an elementary particle can be thought of as a black hole. I think that's, yeah, uh, that's an interesting question. People have speculated on that uh, um, because in some sense, yeah, elementary particles are also unique uh, like black holes are specified by their mass and their spin and so on. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, but of course, if they are in some sense black holes, they would be very tiny, extremely tiny black holes. They, we haven't seen any structure uh, of uh, uh, the elementary particles to, to the scales I mentioned earlier, a billion times the uh, a one billionth of the size of an atom. Uh, we haven't seen any structure at that level. Uh, uh, but there is also another problem, which is that if you have very tiny black holes, they radiate, this Hawking radiation is much higher because uh, the formula that I had in my, uh, uh, if you remember uh, uh, this formula, uh, the temperature is inversely proportional to the mass. So when you have a very small particle, the temperature is actually very high. So it will very quickly radiate uh, away. Uh, uh, and so, uh, it, it, but then that people have talked about things called extremal black holes, etc. So there, there is a, uh, there is some speculation, but uh, uh, nothing very concrete yet. And th there's one uh, um, earlier question that uh, uh, somehow it was not raised. Uh, Sunil Kumar asks, how far generally is a black hole from its companion star? I guess there's no. I mean, there's no fixed distance, but it will be on the scales of uh, like solar system distances. Uh, uh, so, um, that, uh, yeah, so that would depend on the, uh, the masses and their, uh, uh, this thing, it would, they would just be orbiting like a binary system around each other. Uh, by the way, it is these black hole binaries that are orbiting around each other that eventually spiral in. Mm -hmm. uh, I should say that, uh, because of gravitational radiation, uh, uh, unlike in Newton's theory where things can just go in, uh, uh, two bodies can keep 
uh, spinning around each other forever and nothing will change, it's stable. Uh, uh, in, in Einstein's theory, when two bodies are rotating around each other, they will radiate, just like an accelerating charged particle radiates electromagnetic radiation. These uh, accelerating uh, massive objects, these binary objects will also radiate gravitationally and so they will send off ripples, they will lose energy. When they lose energy, they'll come closer, they'll spiral in fast and faster and faster, and finally they'll all merge. And that's how the binary system of black holes, uh, and similarly, there can be binaries of a neutron star and a black hole, et cetera. And these, when they collapse, and uh, are of two neutron stars, they radiate uh, gravitation, burst of gravitational energy right at the end is what can be measured by the LIGO detector on Earth. So there's uh, there are quite a number of questions that have suddenly come up in the Q&A. So I'll, <laughs> I'll take, a, take a few of them. I think yeah. some of them are quite interesting. So Aditya is asking, in the quantum world, uh, don't the, I guess, is the strong, uh, don't the strong forces and electromagnetic forces overtake the effect of gravity? So why should gravity be a concern? Uh, uh, so, yeah. Uh, so, of course, in uh, th this is what happens. Uh, uh, that's what keeps a white dwarf, uh, for instance, from uh, collapsing. Uh, there is, uh, uh, um, there is uh, uh, the strong force in the nucleus, which is, generates a certain pressure. Uh, or in a neutron star, you, it uh, generates a certain pressure, uh, which uh, uh, prevents the gravitational force. But in the end, actually, when the pressure is, uh, when the uh, uh, density becomes higher, um, um, what happens is that those quarks also get liberated. They cannot, uh, they, when the density is very high, they, they form more of what is called a plasma. Uh, and in fact, at very short distances, quarks have no, almost no force uh, 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 between each other. So uh, that, that force is also not sufficient to, uh, to hold up uh, the, this thing. Electromagnetic force gets overcome right at the beginning itself because that's one of, that's uh, much weaker. Uh, and, and, but things become, go to the nuclear uh, scale and they become neutrons, neutral objects, but with the strong interactions. But at some point, the strong interactions are also can be overcome. Uh, because gravity gets stronger and stronger as you as things become as things come closer, uh, so that's one of the whereas uh, strong interactions things actually become weaker as you come close to each other. Also, I guess uh, in order to make sense of the black hole singularity, you have to combine quantum mechanics and gravity. I mean, there is no you cannot think of the two theories as isolated. Yeah, yeah, theories. Uh, yeah, so this is a, an interesting question. I should know the answer to this question, but I wonder, what is the closest black hole to Earth? Does it interact with the Earth in any manner? If <laughs> yes, how? I, I, I don't know in terms of the numbers and the distances, but I think the Cygnus X1 might be one of the closest ones. Uh, um, uh, so I, one would have to look up there. Uh, there. There could be other candidates. People are always finding new, uh, new black holes. Uh, um, uh, so uh, th th those would be of the order of a few light years, I suppose. So there's no, uh, I mean, yeah, not few, I would say tens of light years or hundreds of light years. Uh, so th uh, so they wouldn't interact with the earth in any very um, uh, direct manner, which is lucky for us. But, uh, uh, but actually I should say something for the, as far as the outside of the black hole is concerned, it's no different from that of a star. You only feel the extreme pull when you are very close to the horizon, and uh, I mean in the in those uh, at those scales, uh, uh, because as far as the gravity far away is concerned, it's very much like that of a star of the same mass. Uh, uh, so uh, just like uh, the star in the Cygnus X1 doesn't have any direct effect on us uh, um, uh, gravitationally. Similarly, if there was a black hole there. As far as the gravity is concerned, it would be the same uh, effect uh, on us. Yeah, so, uh, so Arvind is asking for more details about these relativistic jets. So I guess uh, you talk about accretion disks and what happens there. Uh, how does mass escape the black hole? You said it's surrounding mass that escapes. 
not black holes mass can you elaborate so uh, usually the black holes in uh, astrophysics that you see have formed from collapsing stars or or in the binary systems of stars there's always additional matter around it uh, which has which is in the process of swirling in and falling for instance inside it and when these fall they get ionized and they get accelerated to very high speeds uh, very relativistic speeds and there are effects where these charged particles interact with them they create magnetic fields they interact with that and it is those that lead to these jets so that these are very complex uh, phenomena but have not so much to do with the black hole i mean they they do require the certain uh, the extreme uh, uh, features of the black hole but it's ultimately a phenomenon of a very complex electro hydro magneto hydrodynamics uh, that leads to these jets uh, but there uh, but it also the the peculiar the very extreme geometry of the nature and the spin at which uh, the speed at which it is rotating all these things make a difference because the magnetic fields get twisted in particular ways and it's a very uh, fascinating um uh, uh topic of astrophysics but it's a complex phenomenon uh, but it has to do with the matter around it it is not the matter that has already fallen inside the black hole so some of the matter doesn't fall in some of it is uh, for, uh, comes out through these jets and you might have heard of these words like quasars and so on they are actually from 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 jets coming from uh, the black holes in the center of galaxies like the picture i showed of the event horizon telescope so the, uh, in fact if you zoom out of that picture if you go on the net and look for the picture of that black hole if you zoom out you will see a jet coming out uh, of that black hole um, out of that galaxy m87 uh, which uh, which is what you um, uh, which you uh, which is one of the prominent features of that galaxy Uh, but uh, you see that jet but that's on a much larger scale compared to this horizon scale yeah so the, <laughs> there's still a bunch of questions left but i, I think i can collectively in, uh, separate them into two uh, two big questions so uh, uh, one of the questions was uh, what is the implication of this uh, entropy being proportional to the area i think um, maybe you can elaborate a a bit on that now yeah uh, so i didn't say very much so as i said there were two astonishing features of the hawking's formula one was that it was not zero uh, and, and uh, the fact the second was the fact that is uh, the uh, that uh, if it were non zero why is it proportional to the area and not the volume um, so um, the fact that it's non zero uh, a quantum theory of gravity must come uh, 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 like string theory can accommodate the by uh, by counting the number of microstates that are there uh, but the surprising thing even in string theory that people realized was that you get an answer proportional to the area which indicates that the number of degrees of freedom in this quantum gravity theory are far fewer than what you would have in a normal theory a quantum theory of atoms uh, that would uh, that are described by and interacting with electromagnetic forces or other forces uh, because over there the number of states is always grows exponentially with the volume and therefore the logarithm of the volume is always uh, the uh, logarithm of the number of states is proportional to the volume this is why entropy is extensive but uh, uh, here somehow it grows slower because it grows only as an exponential of the area so it's as if the number of degrees of freedom are effectively those of a theory living on the horizon uh, 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 of the black hole it's as if all the degrees of freedom are somehow captured on the horizon of a black on, of the black hole and not in the inside of it uh, uh, so this idea is uh, has been developed and people now there is a uh, the is an understanding of quantum gravity itself as being what is called holographic because a hologram roughly does that it is able on a two dimensional surface to capture sort of a three dimensionality uh, so there's a sense there's i think now in special cases there is a precise understanding of how quantum gravity can be 
holographic in the sense that it can have a description which is uh, which is one low uh, of a t uh, effectively like on a uh, like on a one lower dimensional surface like the horizon itself. Uh, so um, so that's uh, what uh, this thing. I, I, just, I, I just wanted to address in this context also a small question here by Ashok Mishra uh, because he, he asked why I talk about the area rather than the uh, radius uh, because uh, ra so the, uh, it's only in the case of a spherical black hole that it's, uh, there's, you can very easily uh, relate the uh, uh, area and the uh, uh, radius. Uh, it, the area is the more general formula which applies even for uh, a very non-spherical black hole and especially when they are rotating the black hole is very non-spherical. So this area which is the which captures the entropy is, um, is sort of on, uh, uh, can be on this holographic screen, this horizon, which is not necessarily spherical but it's, uh, but it's one lower dimensional compared to the uh, um, this thing. So this is one of the things that string theory has really sort of uh, uh, the, this picture, the fact that string theory could account for this area, uh, 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 you could then understand why it's proportional to the area and this holographic picture has been developed in the last 15-20 years very successfully. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe as a, the final topic of discussion, I think this is a, a quite an elaborate uh, topic, topic of discussion. Uh, so Hawking, of course, uh, uh, another, another thing that uh, uh, Hawking was very famous for is uh, the so-called information paradox. Yeah. So I can tell you a story that when I was a student in Cambridge, yeah. uh, Hawking sent out an email saying that uh, he has solved one of the most profound problems in theoretical physics. So, so we were all gathered in uh, this meeting room three, which was in the basement, and then he comes and then he starts explaining uh, his, uh, his, and I should put it in quotation marks, his solution to the information paradox. So the information paradox, roughly speaking, tells you that quantum mechanics or gravity has to give when you think in terms of black holes, because either probability is not conserved when, when you think in terms of black holes or, or gravity somehow needs to be modified. But there's a question in the question uh, Q&A as well. Somebody is asking, uh, so there's this uh, hawking Susskind debate. Uh, can, can, you, can you comment on that? So what is the status of the information paradox? Maybe you can elaborate on what is, in simple terms, what the information paradox is, and what is the current status, current understanding that we have. Uh, so, uh, like uh, Aninda said, uh, this is something Hawking uh, himself realized that the consequence of the radiation of uh, that the black hole radiates means that it can eventually radiate into nothing, uh, meaning it can emit all its energy and evaporate, uh, uh, just like a, a, a puddle of water evaporates uh, in some sense, goes off. Um, similarly uh, here, um, a black hole, because when, you when it is radiating, it's losing energy and the mass is a finite mass and eventually it can all uh, go off. And that seems very puzzling from the point of view of quantum mechanics because the final state seems to be just a lot of radiation, which is very formless or characterless. Uh, while the initial state that formed the black hole, you would think should have, there should have been some information of how that black hole was formed, all the, maybe it formed from a very particular star, which had a certain composition of different elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, and so on, uh, and hydrogen, helium, and so on in different proportions. Where does all that information go uh, if the final state is just some formless radiation? So this was sort of the information paradox. And there was no good answer for this um, uh, for a very long time. Uh, but once the, the string theory gave an, a concrete example where you could study this question uh, 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 having uh, accounted for the uh, entropy, you could study this question about the radiation also. Uh, uh, people realize that uh, that there is uh, there are probably it is not so simple as just structureless radiation, and uh, there are probably going to be uh, very subtle correlations in the radiation 
uh, and, um, uh, and so Hawking, as the, Aninda said at some point, uh, due to uh, due to the understanding of uh, uh, this holographic principle, uh, Maldacena and others had given a potential way to resolve this uh, uh, Hawking's paradox, this information paradox, uh, and uh, Hawking uh, seemed to agree with that, which is why he, in fact, conceded the bet that he had with uh, so, uh, Preskill, someone else, uh, about uh, uh, about uh, information, because he believed that information is lost and uh, indeed lost, but then he, towards the end of his life, he considered that perhaps it is not. Uh, uh, um, but in any case, uh, uh, the current status is that, I, I, I mean, um, there, uh, people believe, I think the consensus is that information is not lost, People are still trying to address, uh, people are still finding more subtle versions of that paradox, which are, uh, uh, which people are trying to uh, counter. And it's still an evolving subject, but by and large, people believe that information is not lost and they kind of have a picture of how it is not lost, but a more precise, mathematically precise uh, uh, way of seeing exactly how it is not lost is uh, not there, but uh, there there are probably even this year there are recent developments uh, which uh, suggest uh, ways in which you can make that precise. So uh, this is a very active subject right now, and uh, I think a lot of people are trying to understand uh, uh, how precisely this uh, paradox is evaded. But uh, as they said, the consensus is that it is it is indeed evaded. Great. Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, before we conclude, Rajesh, would you mind telling us a little bit about the kind of work that is happening in India now in the area of string theory? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, uh, as I said, I think outside the United States, probably India has uh, the most, uh, not only in terms of numbers, but just in terms of the influence of the work coming from India in shifting the frontiers of physics. And this is happening at a number of institutions all over India, in Bangalore itself, uh, both at the CHEP and IASC, where Ananda is, and at the ICTS, uh, where we are. We both have very strong active groups, which in fact also collaborate uh, with each other as well. And working on some of these, uh, precisely these cutting edge questions on the information paradox, on uh, the holographic principle, and uh, so on and so forth. So. Um, uh, so that, and there are other groups in uh, TIFR in Mumbai, in Harish Chandra Research Institute in Allahabad, uh, um, where we have Professor Ashok Sen, who is probably the most uh, distinguished uh, scientist in a sense since independence from India. Uh, uh, he uh, has made pioneering work and done pioneering work in string theory, uh, in a way the only Indian person to get the breakthrough uh, price uh, outside, outside I think, North America, Europe, and Japan. Uh, um, so uh, anyhow, there are many active groups now in all, many centers in India, and I think uh, they are contributing to, uh, uh, they're really pushing the frontiers in the subject. Uh, uh, but uh, some of the topics that I raised over here, um, uh, I think are, uh, are active areas of research in India. And um, others too, which I haven't had time to uh, uh, talk about, but uh, various other ways in which particle physics connects, uh, string theory connects to particle physics and cosmology. Uh, and cosmology is the study of the very early universe, uh, and uh, string theory again has been, uh, 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 people have been trying to uh, develop scenarios for understanding. Uh, things like the multiverse and other things. There are many speculations out there in that uh, area as well, which I didn't go into. Uh, and um, uh, sim uh, yeah, so particle physics beyond the standard model is another very active area uh, beyond uh, how to sort of unify some of these other forces, uh, the electromagnetic strong and uh, weak interactions. Uh, uh, and combine them ultimately with also with uh, 
uh, gravity. But uh, uh, so yeah, there's a whole plethora of fundamental physics questions that are being explored in India. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a very fascinating evening for all of us. And I just want to, you know, going from the very large to the very small and then talking about some, almost coming to some of the philosophical underpinnings. This has been an extremely interesting uh, evening. And like you said, there is so much work going on. I'm sure we have uh, the opportunity for yet another uh, interaction with yourself and uh, with Aninda as well. I just want to conclude by saying thank you to everyone who's attending. Uh, to both Professor Rajesh Gopakumar and Professor Aninda Sinha for having taken the time to be with us this evening. Uh, thanks very much uh, once again. Thank you. Thank you uh, for hosting it and uh, thanks for joining. In. Yeah, we need to figure out a way of doing a digital applause. <laughs> <laughs> Ready.